inga iwi o te mōte, inga kairanga hau o te pare wānanga nei, kā nui te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. Mō koutou taenga a tinuna mai i tēnei wā, ki te āta whakarongo, ki te āta tikiro, ki te whakawhiti-whiti hoki ngā whakāro e pāna ki tēnei kaupapa, arā te kaupapa e pāna ki ngā whakaritenga o ngā kaupapa Māori ki naro i te āhuatanga o te huarahi mō ngā mahiranga. Nō reira, tēnā tātou katoa. Very warm welcome to this seminar series, Māori and Indigenous Seminar, sponsored by Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, the Centre of Research Excellence Māori for New Zealand. Nō reira, he te kaiwhakahaere o tēnei kaupapa, John, nei te mihi atu i te ato. Me huri ngāia nei ki te rangatira he noho ana ki tēnei tā. So now I turn to this person here. He te rangatira, Tom, kā nui te mihi atu i te ato. He mohi o ana mātou te nuinga o tō mahi, te hōhonu tanga o tō mahi, hoi anō, e tai ana koe, kia tau toko hia, ngā mahi, e pā ana, ki te whakatipuranga o ngā kairanga haumāo. Although you are very busy, we have come from Colorado to share your knowledge and your experience with us here at the University of Canterbury, Te Whanewānanga, or Waitā. It's my job to introduce you. But as a te Arawa person, I'm going to have to try to be very brief. And Tom, I've known you for a little while, a few years actually, and we're honoured that you can come along here as the part of the Erskine program uh, as a Canterbury Fellow in the inaugural Māori and Indigenous Fellow uh, of the University. Uh, you've been very busy and with three or four weeks you've been here, you've got to know a lot of people and you've shared your knowledge and experience. Today you come along and uh, I've got some notes here but I don't really need them, I think I know you well enough. And your, the thrust of your talk uh, I believe it's going to be on research and particularly indigenous methodologies and your experiences of working in a Māori research paradigm. And I've worked with you in that paradigm with Russell Bishop and Mere Berryman and others. And you had that immersion and you moved from your experience in law into indigenous, into Māori uh, and into uh, knowledge areas that include the main research traditions. So I've seen you working and crunching the figures. <laughs> so quantitative research is no stranger to you or you are no stranger to that. No. Nor are you a stranger to the other research tradition, qualitative, where we want the narrative, narratives about what we find. And you were the one who introduced me to Creswell, mm -hmm. who was one of the um, uh, icons, if you like, mm -hmm. of mixed method. Right. But while you were here working and immersed in a indigenous world at Waikato and in other places, you started to learn more yourself about how you operationalize research activities within a Maori an indigenous space. Mm -hmm. So, sort of sum it up, Tom? Very well. Thank you. Ka wātea ki a koe mai are now free it up to you. Tēnā koe. Tom, kia ora tātou. Kei te bai. Thank you, Angus. That was uh, wonderful. I think we've been working together for a little over 10 years now, believe it or not. Uh, Angus is much younger than I am. But, uh, <laughs> he, uh, and John, thank you very much for arranging for this. Uh, it might seem kind of strange for a white guy from America to be talking to you today, so if you feel like that, 
uh, I'll explain how it all happened because <laughs> I'm just uh, very fortunate. Uh, we actually use Copapa Mari uh, research in America for our work with Latino Hispanic people. So uh, th this research is, is not unique uh, or only applicable in New Zealand. It's not, on, not only just applicable to uh, uh, Mari, but it's, it's a research methodology that is very applicable to peoples all over the world. So uh, I, I just want to share with you my experiences. I'd like this to be very iterative. Uh, please don't wait to the end to ask questions. Uh, we're going to cover as much as we can today, and then next week, uh, is it Wednesday of next week? Wednesday, Wednesday of next week, we'll carry on, and uh, we'll go into more depth on these ideas. Also, if you can't be there next Wednesday, if you have questions or uh, want to talk with me, please feel free to do that. I'm really interested in your work. What are you working on right now? And uh, how many of you are in the process of doing a thesis for a PhD? Okay. And how many of you uh, are past that and, and are working on research agenda, getting published? Okay. Great. So. Oh, potential PhD. How many of you are potential PhDs? There's no potential PhDs. It's just a, uh, just a PhD in waiting, I call them. You know? All of my research assistants are PhDs in waiting. Some of them are still working on their master's papers, but that's just a PhD in waiting, I tell them. So uh, uh, good. Glad to see you here, too. This is the area I love. I, I live this, I, I, I enjoy teaching, I enjoy lecturing, but my real passion is doing research. So that means that being a nerd when I went to school is now okay. <laughs> and uh, so this is what I do. In fact, uh, one of the things I'm doing along with the other work I'm doing here is uh, analyzing and writing up uh, data from interviews that I did of Hispanic parents and uh, their children. Uh, in schools at a school where I'm at. So I'm writing, a, I'm not a short writer of the findings. I think they're up to 50 pages already. Uh, so uh, it's the work I love. Uh, I'm very passionate about it. So I just want to share a few ideas. If it works for you, fine. If it doesn't, fine. Uh, but one of the things that, that I work on is how do you marry our way of doing research, Kopapa Mari, with what academia wants, with what the research publications want. What are they looking for? How can we make that work? And so that's something I've worked on really hard uh, because that's not easy. And how, do we so, how can I support you so you can make that uh, happen for yourself? Let me get this. So what I'll do then is uh, go through the process that I go through uh, very briefly, and I can go more in depth on any ideas that you would like me to. Uh, I'm going to go f till about uh, uh, 5.15, 5.20, and then I'll see what other questions and comments you have. And if we don't get through all the slides, we'll do it next week and uh, uh, be glad to do that. But I, I just want to give you an overview. And I want to end up uh, with you that want to publish a little bit about how to get published. Uh, I do a lot of publishing. We just got an article published, was it this week? Yeah. Uh, my first article in Spanish, so. Uh, Spanish, I, I, I speak enough Spanish to get in trouble, but <laughs> academic Spanish is a, a whole new level. So uh, it's a real interesting thing. So uh, our conversations uh, by Skype, uh, with Skype, uh, with uh, Angus and uh, Maria and I, sometimes there's a little Mari, a little Spanish, a little English. They're interesting conversations. Uh, one of the things that, that I think you want to do early on is decide what is your research agenda. 
And you hear that question quite often, uh, when you, whether you're an academic or, or a researcher uh, like myself. This is my research agenda. This is, I'm just going to share with you. And that's real important because once you understand what your research agenda is, then you can set a uh, kind of uh, vision out there for the world to know about. Uh, and that helps to identify you as what is your unique contribution to the field. And you want to identify that as, as, as early as you can. Sometimes it's hard to identify before you finish the PhD, but it's really good to identify because that's what's going to get you published. You, you're wanting to look to what's unique about your work and how does your work fit into the conversation in the field and what does it add to it. So that's really important. Once you've got that figured out, then public, public, uh, getting published is much easier. And what you're going to find is that even journals, once they find out that you have a unique contribution to make, they will actually be seeking you to publish. So most of my publications now are where uh, editors are writing me and saying, I'm going to do a special issue on restorative justice in schools. Will you uh, write an article for us and submit it? So that's how I get most of my publications. It didn't start out that way uh, because I had to get known. But this research agenda is what kept me focused. And if you don't have a research agenda, what you find yourself doing is writing articles on this and that and getting uh, refused and you're all over the map and you're, you're trying to fit what you're doing to what they're wanting to publish rather than you having an agenda and looking for a uh, publication that likes your work and will publish it. And so that's why I think it's important to have a research agenda as soon as you can and get it down in writing. Here's the key. John and I already talked about this. Most people starting their, their uh, doctorate studies and their thesis are way too broad. So what we want to do is bring it down to a cup of tea. So what Cresswell recommends, and I think is great advice, what is the central phenomenon you want to study in three to five words? If you can reduce your central phenomenon to three to five words, and there's my three words, that then focuses your entire document because it, everything you do is aligned around that central phenomenon, including your lit review. So the sooner you can get that reduced, the better. Otherwise, what you're going to find is you're trying to solve world hunger with your doctoral thesis. And that's no time to solve world hunger because you're just a novice researcher. Uh, you can save that for later. But for your thesis, keep it a cup of tea, something that's doable, something that's achievable, and something you can get done in a reasonable amount of time. Because the object is get the doctorate, and then you can do the other work. And you can get paid for it rather than paying for it. That's what I always tell my students. The other thing is the doctorate is mainly to show that you can do the work. It's not to solve the big problems. It's to demonstrate that you can do the research. So that is another reason why keeping focus. But the other thing I'm going to tell you, for publications, when you want to publish, they're interested in publishing on one topic, keeping it very thin, very focused. I've seen people try to actually submit the contents of their dissertation as a research journal article. And you can imagine, when I go to review an article like that, I am just overwhelmed. How in the heck can you talk about your two or 300 page uh, thesis in a simple little 20-page journal article. But I've seen people try to do that. So reduce it to one central phenomenon. Here's the background I'll, I'll give you. 
for what got me here. Uh, it started off with my uh, dissertation uh, back in Colorado, uh, which I finished in 2003. And in 2004, I got a Fulbright to come to New Zealand and uh, was fortunate enough, uh, I wanted to study restorative justice in schools in New Zealand. Uh, many of you know that uh, uh, the beginnings of restorative justice are with Mari, and uh, that's, uh, uh, I learned that early on, so I thought I need to come to New Zealand. Now, I was fortunate enough to have some good advice to study at the Raglan Area School. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that school, but it's a lovely little school besides being a lovely beach, uh, but uh, it's got the mainstream, bicultural, bilingual, and Kurokopapa all in one school. So it was ideal for a researcher, except for the Kura because I didn't speak Mari. Uh, so the way I learned enough to get along was to the students uh, and I made a deal. They would teach me Mari and I would answer their questions about America. So, uh, of course, uh, their first question was, do you know Stoop Dog, or Soup Dog, or whatever his name is? And uh, I said, no, I have no idea. So I think they had the concept that America was very small, so you, you must have run into him sometime. But, of course, I didn't even know who they were talking about. But, <clears throat> so I was there for a year, and that, uh, after that year, or during that year, uh, I actually uh, met uh, Angus, I met Ted Glenn, I met Russell Bishop and Mary Berryman. And it was an interesting, uh, well I say quirk of fate, uh, the uh, Takotahi Tonga project had had a bunch of quantitative data that was uh, analyzed by another researcher and uh, you know Americans are so uh, quiet about things. Well, he gave a report in public about what the results were, and I said, those results are not right. And of course, everybody in the audience is saying, who is this bloody American saying it's not right? And I said, if you calculated it right, you couldn't have got that result. It was, he was calculating an effect size. And so uh, ears picked up and so forth, and of course, Russell came over to me because the results were not that favorable. He said, what are you saying? And I said, if they were calculated properly, you couldn't have got that result. It's impossible. So he said, would you recalculate it? And I said, sure, give me the data, I'll recalculate it. Well, I had to re-enter all the raw data. It took me four months to get the data and to re-enter it. And then I ran the calculation and found out that the project, in fact, was doing very well. And that resulted then in the Ministry of Education funding the project and keeping the project going and expanding it. Wow. Was it 33 million? Gee, I didn't realize. I, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Russell said, would you like to come on our research team? Can you imagine? I never thought nobody, that would ever happen. And I was so privileged. I said, well, of course, I'd love to. Uh, and that was the beginning. Working with Angus and Ted all through that, and then uh, Miri and Russell uh, really got me indoctrinated and uh, uh, really helped me to become appreciative of uh, Mari and, of course, Kopapa Mari research. Then, from there, in 2009, I went back to the United States and I took what I learned and replicated it in the United States with Latino Hispanic people. And particularly, at, we went to a high school outside of Denver, and we did a three-year pilot project, and uh, we finished that last school year. And that, the results were so good that we are now replicating that in a number of middle schools and other schools. So uh, we're quite happy about that. And uh, so we have, uh, that was at Hinckley High School. And we, as you know, in America, students graduate from high school. They have the whole graduation process. The graduation rate for Latino Hispanic students rose by over 20% in those three years, which is just 
quite remarkable. Uh, so we were really happy with that. I have to tell you, uh, when you told me that uh, Na Pai was uh, uh, underwriting this, this, I was uh, uh, very much uh, happy about that because they also paid for my work with the uh, Gotahi Tonga. So I, uh, I mean, just think about it. Here's a naive American, never been to New Zealand, doesn't have mu much exposure with Mari, and one of the first people I meet is Linda Smith. And I'm going, go, well, who's Linda Smith? <laughs> That's how naive, I had no idea. And uh, so uh, I met her, because she was up at, at Auckland at that time and, and running NAPI, and uh, they funded my position then with uh, Tokotahi Tonga. So I learned a lot from her, and she came and visited us at Colorado State uh, last October. So that was really nice to have her come. Here are the two keys that, that, that we learned from Linda's work. That everything you do starts with relationships. If you ever lose sight of that, you've lost it. So let me give you an example. I get people at the university all the time that say, gee, I'd like to work with you on your project. I said, okay, come around, we'll have lunch together. The team's having lunch next week. And they look at me like, what? <laughs> or I'll say, we're gonna have coffee down at Starbucks on Thursday, why don't you come and join us? And they go, but don't you have a job I can do? I said, no. But I got a few people I'd like you to meet. See, we have to see how they fit into the team first. But Americans are so oriented to doing the task first and then getting to know you. So they put the task before the relationships and they let the task decide how the relationships work. See, the pophory is a great example. The relationships come first, and then you talk about the task. Well, that makes a lot more sense, but you always have to keep that in mind when you're doing this research because the dominant is task-oriented. I decide how I'm going to relate to you based on your job and my job. And we talk nothing about where you come from, who your family is, what our connections might be. We might not ever know. But if we build those relationships first, then we know. And that's what makes, frankly, not just good Kopapamari research, it makes good sense. Because that's what creates a good research team are those relationships. What happens with when you're task oriented, as soon as you finish your task, we don't have a relationship. And that's why it's so easy in the dominant culture to get rid of people. Your task is over, out the door. I have no commitment to you as a person. So we don't build our research team. We don't go into a school to do research until we've built relationships. We don't interview people until we've built relationships. We don't observe until we've built relationships. It's always relationships first. So you can't go wrong if you keep that number one in your mind. The second idea is humility. And boy, I'll tell you, as an American, I had to learn that big time. And that's to take a position of unknowing. And that's really important to take that position to say, I don't know. Now that was easy for me at Raglan Area School. I could very easy say, I don't know Mari, never been here, I don't have an idea. Will you tell me? But if you're doing research in your own family or your own local setting, that's hard because you've got all kinds of assumptions about well, the way things are and the way things should be and the way things can be. I had no idea. So I was really in a good spot. I remember I went to Angus the first time I'd been there for a couple of months and 
done a little observing and talked to people. And I, I put out a little memo to the staff at Raglan Area School about some things I had observed and uh, what I was kind of gathering. And the head of the uh, Mari boys, you, you know how that works. They, they have a special uh, teacher for the Mari boys. Danny came up to me, he said, uh, Tom, would you like to come on camp with us? We're going to camp next week over in the Coromandel. So I went to Angus, I said, well, Angus, uh, gee, what do you think this means? He said, you better go on camp. <laughs> and I go, okay. I don't know what this has to do with research. He says, you better go on camp. So I, I said, Danny, sure, I'm in. I had no idea what I was getting into. And you can imagine, it was quite interesting. Uh, but I did. Well, they started out calling me Dr. Tom and they ended up calling me Matua. So you can see the change over the time. And uh, I slept in the garage along with them and uh, I didn't do the diving. I'm not that good at diving, but I did about everything. That was what was important. They wanted me to experience their way of life with them. And I took a position, I have no idea. So that's the real important thing, is that, that whole idea of humility. Now I'm going to tell you, as a quantitative researcher, that's difficult. Because you start your quantitative study with hypothesis that you already know. You have an idea of the way it should be. So what I tell people doing a quantitative study using Copapamari, when you pose your hypothesis, pose them very, uh, shall I say, with hesitation. I'm posing this hypothesis, but not with the sense that I know this is right, but I'm not sure, but I'm going to pose it to test it. Too often you have quantitative researchers that assert a hypothesis as this has got to be the answer and I'm going to prove it. And so when we do Copapamari, we want to be more hesitant. Qualitative research is easier because you go in with a position, I'm doing this research because I don't know and I want to find out more. I'm exploring. I want to gain more understanding. So when you're designing a study, I'm just going to go through this uh, real quickly, and I think this is the area where next week we can go into in, in more detail. Uh, this is the actual uh, how we write the study. Uh, we want to the title to reflect not only the one central phenomenon, but what is the research design, qualitative or quantitative, and who are the participants? So we have a, a little description from the title. Too often we try to make the title fancy, kind of like selling a used car, but we don't get the, the pertinent information out. Now, the question always comes up, can I use a colon in the, in the title? I will tell you, you the journals go both ways. Some like colons, some don't. So the other thing is with your, your uh, title for your thesis, make it a working title. I can tell you, I changed the title on my doctoral, uh, we call it a dissertation, so many times I forgot what the title was. But it could change right up to the last moment. So don't get married to your title. But it's good to have one. Good to have a working title. The, the research purpose is real important. I tell people if you don't quite know what you want to study, tell me or finish this sentence, the purpose of my study is, and put it into ordinary layman's language, not academic language. Just finish that sentence, and when students come to me and they say, gosh, I'm not sure what I want to do, what I want to study, I say, if you'll finish that sentence, I guarantee you within 20 minutes we'll have it nailed. So that helps me to have them express it in a way that makes sense to them to get us started. Then we can decide what the one central phenomenon is and go from there. The research question. You have to realize that with a quantitative study, you have to have a very precise research question and a very precise set of hypotheses to go along with it. 
I recommend that if you're doing a quantitative study, start out with one research question and the null and the alternative hypothesis. Don't try for three or four. It's really difficult. Everything you put in there just makes it more complicated. The same with a qualitative study. Start out with one research question, very broad, realizing the beauty of qualitative research that you don't have with quantitative is you can change the question. A lot of people don't realize that. In my dissertation, my original research question was very different from the end research question because my data didn't support the original research question. So when I looked at the data and after I analyzed the data, I went back and said, hmm, doesn't match the question, change the question. Isn't that wonderful? Guess what happens if that happens with quantitative research? You have to start over. So you, you can't uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, changing the question midstream. The other thing to realize if you're doing a quantitative study, and you, it, let's say that you fail to reject the null hypothesis, don't worry about it. Over half of the uh, doctoral thesis that do use a quantitative approach fail to uh, reject the null. So if you fail to reject the null, that's not a big problem. That's very, very ordinary. A lot of people think if you fail to reject the null, you have to start over. You really don't. The other thing is, I put a couple of sites here. Uh, the literature is there for the qualitative study to support that you start with one broad question. And then you can add questions later on as you go through the study, you can refine that. But starting off with one broad question is a good way to start. Here are the research designs that are common for qualitative. Uh, most of our quantitative studies, uh, we do very few true experimental studies. And the reason for that is, number one, they're expensive. Number two, they take a huge sample size. And I mean huge, because you're doing random assignment. Third, it's hard to find a place that will let you gather that much data and disrupt and let you randomize. So most of our studies, and particularly if you're doing studies like in a school setting, have to be quasi-experimental. That means you're using intact groups. And uh, we used to have the attack on uh, Toko Tahitanga all the time. I forget the name of the fellow uh, at Massey that used to attack that we weren't using uh, the gold standard of randomized uh, 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 studies. And, uh, you know, uh, Russell would come in, well, why aren't we using randomized studies? And I said, because it's ethically impossible in schools. You can't randomize in schools. You have to use intact groups. Uh, you can't disrupt the schools and do those kinds of studies. And he said, oh, will you tell him that? And I said, no, but you can. <laughs> so uh, that's on the uh, 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 quantitative side. So largely on the quantitative side, we'll, we'll do studies that are about differences or relationships. Uh, if we're using a survey, it's about relationships. If we're looking at student data, then it's about differences. That's, that's basically. But on the qualitative side, we have these uh, research designs. The uh, basic difference is whether you're looking at purpose or problem. The case study is usually used if you have a problem that you're wanting to study. You've identified a problem. A case study is very good for that. The others, uh, except for narrative, could be used for either one. The others are purpose-based. So ethnography has the purpose of looking at a culture sharing group. Phenomenology's purpose is to look at the essence of a phenomenon. And grounded theory is for the purpose of creating a theory. And of course, uh, that's what I used because I was creating a theory of a culture of care in school. Narrative can go either way. Narrative is a capturing of stories about the phenomenon. So it can be related to a problem or it can be a purpose. 
So the key to data collection and analysis is it has to be systematic. In other words, you have to use a way of collecting the data and for instance, uh, generally with qualitative uh, research, we use interviews and observations and documents. With uh, the other thing is when you analyze the data, you have to use a systematic method. Usually we use uh, typological and inductive. So if you have some themes or, or codes that you know about ahead of time that you want to use, that's typological. The inductive is that you're coding the data to come up with the themes. So they're emerging. The, the one, I, I'd caution you, the one uh, approach to analyzing the data you need to be careful about is what is generally called thematic. Uh, authors are very reluctant about thematic because it's not well defined in the literature. Uh, there's often no coding involved and most researchers want to see coding of each chunk of data or unit of meaning to come up with the themes. What they're worried about is that what's happening is the data is being read uh, once or twice and people are saying, gee, I think this is what the data is saying. Recher the researchers want a systematic method of coding to come up with the themes. Now, if any of you are interested in how that's done, I'm doing it down in my office. I can actually just show you how, how it works. So let me end up with, with the publishing. Uh, the first thing about publishing is you got to get a thick skin. Uh, if you don't have a thick skin, please get one. Remember, it's about the paper. It's not about you. So they're critiquing the paper. They're not criticizing you as a person. So please separate your work. I know you love what you're doing, because I do. I spend years doing it. But you got to do that. Uh, I, I have fights with editors. I have fights with reviewers all the time, uh, disagreements and so forth. But you're going to get reviewed. My last article took three years to get published, went through nine reviews, count it, nine. That means nine times I had to go through, revise, resubmit. So you got to think about that. So the other thing is know what your passion is and what your topic is well and look for that to get published, rather than trying to meet what they are uh, they're about. The, the one idea that I, I think about is when you look at your research and, and look at your dissertation, for instance, you want to publish, think of it as an onion with many layers. And all you want to publish is one layer. So you want to just slice that onion very thin. You want to keep your, your article very focused on one idea. And that's, that's what authors want to see. They don't want you trying to cover a whole bunch of things in one article. They want it very focused. And then I tell people, you're going to get rejections. So just know that up front. But don't even touch your article until it's rejected three times, three different journals. The reason for that is, pardon me? That's advising advice. I haven't heard that about that. But that was a powerful thing I once done. It was like, we got completely trolled, like 10 pages of trolling. And it just blew me out of the world. Absolutely. Well, a good example is the article we just published. We got flat rejected by the first publisher, completely accepted with no um, uh, corrections or revisions on the second. Editors reject for all kinds of reasons. They don't like the topic. They don't have the space. They woke up on the wrong side of the bed. So you can't take a rejection. Reviewers review from all kinds of perspective. Now, 
quite honestly, what happens often is you get a quantitative researcher reviewing a qualitative study and vice versa. And that happens to me all the time. And I simply go back to the editor and I'll say, find the, a reviewer that knows what they're talking about. Because this, this review is just simply ludicrous and I can't respond to it because the reviewer doesn't understand qualitative research or Copapamari or whatever methodologies I'm using. So you're gonna have that happen. So that's why not to take it too seriously. Sometimes you get two reviews that are poles apart. One <laughs> likes the, the, the article, the other one that's just right. likes it immensely. And usually the editor will err on the side of caution. And erring on the side of caution means they'll take the, the, the one who refers rejecting the writer. That's right. Yeah. And the, the, they'll contradict each other. And if the editor doesn't uh, uh, get that, then you need to go back to the editor and say, look it, there's a contradiction here. And don't, don't feel bad about uh, arguing with editors. I do it all the time. Uh, I coined uh, a phrase, marginalized, minoritized, and racialized, in, in an article I published in Protected Children. And the editor said, both reviewers said, we will not let you use those phrases. They're too inflammatory. The American audience does not want to hear that. And uh, so the editor came to me and says, you got to drop it. And I said, fine, I'll withdraw the article. I'm not dropping those phrases. Those, those words are important. The editor backed off. They actually published it with those three words in it. And that phrase now is used uh, in the literature. It's cited um, quite often. So, you know, it, it's hard, but occasionally you can tell an editor, I'm taking a stand on this one. And then uh, they'll have to make a decision. And I, I'm quite frank. You know, I, I have to take my boldest thing uh, was I wanted to publish about our work in the Journal of School Violence. Okay. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Journal of School <laughs> Violence. I was tired of reading their articles about how we needed to have all these dogs and police and all this. And I said, I, I wrote the editor. I mean, you can tell I'm just horrible. I wrote the editor and I said, this is about how to create a school of peace and nonviolence in a, in a culture of war and violence. I said, I dare you to, to publish this. And the editor came back to me and said, I think I will. So he did. So, that can happen too. <laughs> well, let me stop there and uh, we can go into more next week, more depth. And uh, I, I'd like to go into your own work, uh, particularly next week. But any questions or comments? How long did it take you to get it contacted? <laughs> <laughs> a long time. <laughs> you can imagine, uh, uh, I was a court reporter for years. So I sat in a courtroom and I ran one of those little machines. I never said anything. Uh, and then I went back to school, and I mean, I was in my 50s, and I'd never had to talk. I never had to be in front of people. I just did my job. It took me quite a while. I had to go to Toastmasters to <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But I think the thing that did it is, is my topic. I'm just so passionate about the work I do that that overcame the rest of it. And uh, I, I sp now I talk more from the heart than anything. Yeah. So if, do you have something you're passionate about? She does. <laughs> well, that's, what we'll, that's what we'll do it. Yeah, it, just, there's, there's a line because you want to be modest as well. And that's the thing that really gets me is you, want, you, know, you might be passionate about something, but then there's a line, I think, that you could cross where it turns into a modesty and then people don't want to listen. You, you know, that's true, but there's this, what Mari taught me was you focus on the kopapa, not the person. As long as we're focused on the kopapa, then it's hard, you're less likely to cross that line because it's not about you, it's about the work. So I focus very much on the work that we do. And I always, the people that I work with, I say that's the important thing, that we stay focused on the work. The individuals don't matter. <laughs>
but well, I shouldn't say they don't matter. But the work is what is, is the important thing. And in Tokotahi Tonga, that's what we constantly worked on because our Akuya and Kumatua always were reminding us. So if you're passionate about something, that becomes the focus, not you as an individual. Thank you. Angus, thank you for the meeting. Tom, e rangatira, tenakwe. Thank you. Mm. I've got a, um, a hemato. Oh, my word. And uh, it's a bit like, I think today, uh, a bit of a fishing up of stuff. Maui. Um, he fished up Tika Maui, the, mm. the North Island. Mm. And I feel that uh, definitely for myself, uh, there's new revelations, and I think even Lindsay was saying these uh, the amazing uh, the talks that I've had, making it so understood. So research typically uh, seems really complicated, but in the time that I've spent, and very little time with Tom, but that time that I've spent with you, it's, why couldn't someone just say that in two sentences? <laughs> so um, thank you very mm. much for uh, coming today. Oh. And, uh, is appreciation. Oh, this means mm. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, that, that's really our, our proceeding for today. But um, do stay around and, and call it all. At the back here, we've got some kai and um, help yourself to that. Karaki is all done for that. And um, I think if you've got the opportunity to pick Tom's brain free, he leaves the room. So um, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, tēnā rā koutou Thank you very much. Thank you.